All right, we're back for our third episode tracing Eddie Murphy's comedy career. In this episode, we're talking about his cult classic, Delirious. No, we're not, of course, man. It's the Akira Volume 1 episode. My name's Ed Piscor. My name's Jim Rugg. My name's Tom Scholey. It's the main event. What if we just uh, jump right into things? First off, I never read Otomo's comics in a linear fashion in this way, going from Fireball to Domu, then on to Akira. It kind of occurred to me, and let me know if you guys felt this or am I crazy, man, but I got the feeling that Domu is in the same universe as Akira. Just kind of like a prequel. And I have some things to go along with that. Like, where are you on the on, on that fence? I, I don't... I'll be curious to hear your points on that. Yeah, you're blowing my mind with this. Like, I, But that, yeah, that's really interesting. And it seems like something that, like, fans of his work... There might be a whole body of, of knowledge of, of people who've, who've, like, looked way deep into this. So it'd be interesting. To explore. There's nobody Nothing. that's made a connection this yeah. way. And here are some of my points. And it actually goes <clears throat> along with a lot of stuff that we were talking about in the Domu episode, so if you guys haven't seen the Domu episode, I encourage you to uh, dig into that before we get into the, the real meat with Akira. But it all goes along with things that we were talking about. Uh, one of the things that kept coming up in Domu is how no adults, no civilians knew what the heck was going on uh, with these kids with these powers or whatever. So what happens if the adults do discover that this is a thing. What's the first thing that's going to be done if the government finds out that there are people out there who have this ability, man? They're going to weaponize that shit. Some of the things that you were talking about with old Cho's superpowers, and you were like laying them out. He can phase. Little Takashi from Akira can phase. Also, the kids in Akira, they're late sequels. The earliest one is number 26, Little Takashi. So what if uh, Itsuka is number one? Hmm? To add fuel to that concept, let's go. When I was doing research on Akira, you start to figure out it's set in 2019, right? So those kids are born in like 2004, 2005. Domu's set in the present. Which would have been 82. Yes. So if you're thinking like that is a beginning or that maybe early stages of people, police, government officials, somebody becoming aware of some phenomena here, it would be a second generation, a third generation. It, it would have time to develop, to have like, hey, let's dovetail some funding to explore this. We think we have a phenomena on our hands, maybe to be weaponized, certainly to be researched. And that's the beginning. And you see, essentially, Akira would be two generations later. And, and you know, the, the explosion happens... In the 90s. Right, yeah. So it's still little kids. You know, Itsuka might have been a, a young teenager at that point. Um, in the first volume of Akira, whenever Tetsuo starts to show signs of having the power, when when the uh, the colonel is talking with uh, with the guy, in with the doctor in that high skyscraper, the doctor sort of suggests that Tetsuo is about to awaken, and he talks about having evidence of there being teenagers who have awoken before, suggesting that it's always children, mm -hmm. like right. Itsuka. I, I'm on board with this theory, like having <laughs> just heard it just now, I'm on board with this theory. And also if, if Otomo were to refute it and say that's absolutely not my intention, like it doesn't really matter because that's like sort of the intentional fallacy. Like it doesn't matter what he intended, we just know the work. And so far everything you're saying seems to bear out in, in the work and it's it, it doesn't seem to be contradicted either. And even if it were contradicted, we're used to you know, self-contradictory texts anyway, but but I, I like this theory. Let's I'm signing off on that theory. <laughs> the, the other big thing uh, that really kind of solidified it for me too was just that one moment where Tetsuo is like leaving the little hospital room and the guy is like, hey, how'd you get out of there? And then when we see that guy next, his head is just splattered up against the wall, has shades of that little balsa wood student boy who like slit his throat and kind mm -hmm. of exploded all over the place whenever he met with uh, Itsuka for the first time and she uh, was scared out of her wits. I it's made the same exact note. A absolutely. Visually, it, it's hard not to see that as a callback. You're yeah. in a corridor. It's even almost the same setting in a way. Yeah. I mean, at the very least, this is Akira's a, a, like a thematic progression. Like like even even if it's not intended to to literally tie in, he's developing like the same ideas and taking taking them a step forward and, and and you know explicitly linking them would be icing on the cake when i think of the connection between those two works one obvious one and it's visual it's in the art but the expression of those psychic powers is really consistent there are a mm -hmm. lot of characters with their heads down sweating eyes bulging 
it's exactly the same as old Cho. I think that's fuel to the, it's the same universe. It's the same yeah. timeline, you know, cut to future of this developing further because visually that psychic power is represented exactly the same. And it's all, they, they coined the term psychokinesis in there. Mm-hmm. And it's all the stuff, man. It's levitating objects. It's, uh, there's a flying. Yeah. And then, like, if you want to take it down, like, the, the furthest sort of direction down the path that both of these things are connected, what if Old Cho isn't old at all? Yes. I saw a com- somebody made a comment about Old Cho's connection to the Tezuka lady, which we had mentioned and brought up, and the connection to the, her child. That makes good sense, Ed. Yeah. The idea that, you know, visually, I made a note about these kids and how they, why they look the way they look. And in my mind, it was partly solving the problem of we're in black and white. How do you represent these children as being different in some way? And it was like, that's one way to do it very easily in black and white. Whenever we see color versions, you start to see blues Blue and skin, different yeah. things. But in black and white, it's like that's a really distinguishing characteristic. And again, it is like old Cho. Like, there's a very clear line between those two, especially visually. The other connection, I love this connection because it's not one I thought of, Ed, before you brought it up. But the idea that this is a continuation of Domu, you know, several decades later, not just the program is expanded in terms of like we had this kind of small confined phenomena happens in Domu in in an apartment, a couple people, not that big of a deal. We're not blowing up Tokyo or Mm -hmm. Neo-Tokyo. My impression when I started reading Akira is it's huge. It has exploded. And, you know, it's it's the psychic powers, the vast size of the program around those psychic powers and the world that Otomo is now like creating and stalking to be the backdrop of this story is immense compared to Domu. And it's almost a mirror or a parallel to the immensity of this psychic program in terms of budget, in terms of power, in terms of all the characters that are involved to facilitate this thing and to try to control it or develop it. It's almost like both of those things come out of Domu and it's just growth. You know, it's like this thing's going to explode and here it is three decades later. Can I go down this... Please. Path just even a little bit yes, further please. because of what you just said. There's a big part of me that thinks that Fireball is a part of this universe as well. Sure. And in volume one, when we see page one and we see the cataclysmic explosion, it's not mentioned that Akira was the cause of that. It says that there was right. a bomb that exploded yep. over Tokyo. But what if that bomb was that and a couple pages of Fireball because the story ends where you see the, the globe of the earth in mm-hmm. the very last panel. So you could imagine the very next panel from there could have been just that big cataclysmic explosion, mushroom cloud, all of that stuff. And that is the evidence of like the military in- intervention, like trying to figure out how to contain this power for, mm-hmm. for weaponized use because in Fireball, it's the government who is tearing this old guy, this, this soldier apart to try to see what's making him tick. So I actually think it's all related, sure. but I think that the similarities are far tighter than what I was thinking in, mm-hmm. in the earliest uh, stages of putting these episodes together. But we're about 10 minutes in. Let's get into Akira Volume 1, man. Okay. Just to be clear, because I could obviously be missing something. In Volume 1, it's not explained what what caused that first mushroom cloud, correct? Right, yeah, they, they call it a weapon. I don't even know if they use the word bomb. Maybe they call it a bomb, but they they say a weapon, and I was kind of wondering, like, what the nature... Because initially, the first time I'd read this, I thought, that it's this big black ball, this big black dome, and I thought, oh, that's that thing where, like, to simulate retinal overstimulation, you draw, like, the sun black or yeah. something. And so it's like that. It's It's actually not a black... Clap. But then this on this reading, I'm like, okay, is this like not just some kind of super nuke or something, but maybe it's some kind of like black hole bomb or dark matter or some kind of thing like that. And then, of course, the thing of like, maybe it is one of these kids, you know, Akira or, or the kid from Fireball or something, you know, it's it's, you know, because they, they he doesn't really specify exactly what it just a new type of weapon or a new type of bomb or whatever. We open up with the motorcycle gang. How would you define these? boys Kaneda, Tetsuo and the crew as a gang. To me they're just like little hellions. They're they're not really uh there's not like in modern days like gangs it's like drug affiliated in terms of like selling, but these kids are more recreational users if if anything. The the very little bit that I know about Japanese culture is that you know there are like class A, B, C students. And these boys are like class C. You know, they're they're the kids who are um social pariahs. The way that Otomo is building the Kaneda character, like not only does he do drugs, but 
he he's also potentially going to be a father like out of wedlock mm-hmm. as a teenager and there was a stigma here in America for the longest time about that sort of thing. Japan is notoriously a little bit more conservative. Certainly in 1981, 82, Otomo's really painting a picture that this kid is like social reject. Yeah, and he's even kind of like when 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 she tells him that she's pregnant, he's kind of like, "Well, that's your problem." <laughs> <laughs> they're all they're all students in a vocational school. My high school had a vocational like wing and it was stigmatized. You know, there was a thought of the type of students that go there, which is a shame because in hindsight, like I knew some of those teachers yeah. and would interact in different ways. And in hindsight, those look like the best programs in yeah, the really schools. useful skills that you <laughs> well, can totally use. <laughs> technology was oh, there. Yeah. The teachers were most committed. It's just for whatever reason, it was stigmatized as like you go there because you're a class C student. Mm-hmm. And that's what I thought of whenever they show their school and it's a vocational school. It's like, this is your last hope. This is your last chance or whatever. That's all I could think of. And I have no idea how that would relate between Japanese society and American. You know, that that type of vocational training would be considered class C. Obviously, these students are, uh, you know, they make that clear through dialogue and interaction with the teachers and faculty. But I don't know if there's a bigger, you know, if, if that's a bigger cultural thing or not. But it was something that came to my mind just because, like, personal experience. If I was to come up with a title for this episode, I think the title would be called The Poison Pill. Because the pill is the MacGuffin that kind of carries the narrative pretty much through most of of this volume. You would agree? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and it makes sense that it's like kind of emblematic of the series is this pill. And I I didn't realize just how much the pill was a factor in the plot until this rereading. It's like, wow, that pill is like that's that's the uh, the Maltese Falcon or whatever that everybody's kind of chasing. It's such a fascinating comic because probably three quarters of the Akira anime takes place in this volume here. Now... Otomo serialized Akira in Young Magazine from 1982 to 1990, and the Akira anime came out in 1988. So it's this ping-pong effect where he initially creates a story in the manga, and for the anime, he tightens that first two acts up really tightly in the anime, and then has to come up with an ending almost in a George R. R. Martin fashion where right. they're going to be putting out like the last uh, season of Game of Thrones and he hasn't written the book yet. So he had to come up with an ending for that anime. And perhaps in the manga, he's able to take a second pass at that ending sure. and make that even tighter. When has that ever happened mm-hmm. in fiction? Besides, yeah. I guess, Game of Thrones. Yeah, Game of Thrones. And, and, and that's all conceptual because that hasn't taken place as of this recording yet. I wonder if that happened when writers uh, serialized, like Charles Dickens or something, Mm -hmm. if when he was doing collections, it was heavily revised. I'm sure there's an answer to that. I just don't know it. But, you know, that's when it that's when you would get a chance is if it were to appear somewhere and then you publish it in another form, which, as you say, it is pretty rare. Usually it's minor edits that I'm aware of, like when cartoonists go from serialized to a collection, sometimes there'll be minor edits. But a whole reworking like that on a scale of a major motion picture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I can't think of another example. So Akira was serialized in Young Magazine. I wonder if, upon this latest rereading, like, did you guys make note of trying to imagine where the chapter breaks were whenever uh, you would read, like, a nice segment and just imagine, like, okay, I bet I bet it ended right here. I would have loved for this thing to be broken up in chapters to just see how mm-hmm. the original readers might have checked the thing out. I tried that. I looked at the epic issues to try to figure out, okay, is that like three chapters? If this is 18 chapters worth and it's like six issues of epic and it's, it's hard for me to figure that part out, but it was something I thought about. And I'm sure it it breaks on scenes, you know, I'm sure you can figure, figure it out in some cases. In the history of collecting serialized works in comics, it seems like for a really long time, there was like an embarrassment about these things being serialized. So they would try to cover that up as much as possible. Now you can kind of accept it and, and sort of have like a title, but there's a lot of comics where they would like remove the title from the splash page or, or tr- try to try to, you know, fool you into thinking, no, this was conceived as a novel and executed as a, as a novel. So, you know, m- maybe for some, you know, future reworking of volume, but yeah, that would, that would be great to see this. You know, Young Magazine, so it starts Kodansha, one of the big publishers in Japan, believes there's a market between sort of like kids manga and adult manga. And that's what Young Magazine is is developed to form. When I was reading this, I kept thinking about how young adult it is, you know, which has become such a huge genre in American book sales now. I enjoy genre deconstruction, so it's very easy to look at like, how does this fit? 
And Akira fits perfectly. There are almost no adult figures. The ones that are there are not parents. It's basically these kids that are in their teenage, you know, teenagers that are trying to figure this stuff out to solve these big problems. And they're doing all the stuff that teenagers do. And you think like Fireball, I'm not sure if Fireball was in Young or not, but Domu was. So it's almost also a progression of like, what fits this audience? What is this like in between adult and kid audience? What fits them? And it feels like Akira is the perfect fit for that audience. Again, I don't know that to be true because of social, major social differences and I, I'm projecting, but they are like this kind of young, they're fashionable. It feels like that's a fit for if you're trying to get teenagers as well, an yeah, audience. Um, reading this, I was a little like shocked at how young Kaneda looks because the iconography of Akira comes largely from the movie. And in the movie, it's almost like it's a different demographic. So, so Kaneda's depiction is sort of more heroic in the movie, he's like more broad shouldered, more of like kind of like a Mad Max kind of character. Where in this, he's like a scrawny, like he's like a twerp. Yeah. When you when you watch the movie, like, and we're not going to talk anime too much, right. but yeah. like he he is still the same character though. One of the things I want to take a look at when we go through every volume to the end is his progression in terms of like hero's journey because I don't think it goes very far. I think he's basically <laughs> a boob the entire time. Sure. That's interesting. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, uh, what we saw with Domu is that Otomo really isn't into this whole hero thing, you know, and, and he doesn't do any of the things that you would do to sort of ingratiate uh, Kaneda with us the way you would like, you know, Luke Skywalker or something like he's there. There's there's nobody here to particularly root for. I mean, you tend to root for the good looking uh, uh, young people in a work of fiction, but he's not going out of his way to make it easy for you to root for anybody. And he characterizes this whole gang, Canada's whole gang, very well in that they're sort of a street gang, biker gang. They do some drugs, as you said, Ed. They interact with other gangs sort of as rivals and fighting and things. But they're also not that tough. You know, like they get in trouble in school and they're and they're kind of uh, meek at times, you know, yelling their comebacks whenever they're leaving school or away from the uh, bully gym teacher or whoever's, you know, kind of lording over them in a tough fashion. And it's humor. It's, it's really great. I found that to be something that is missing from a lot of the contemporary comics I read. If it's a tough comic, if it's an action comic, your hero is not really going to be made to look silly, foolish, weak, mm -hmm. any of these things. And it's not the dominant characteristic of these guys, but it's very humanizing. You know, they mess up. They slip on banana pills in a way. And, and definitely they posture a lot about that toughness and trying to impress yeah. the girls they come in contact with. But all of that to me just was very humanizing. Like I found it to be like, oh, this is great. I can cheer for this guy because I can also identify with, you know, being embarrassed in, in front of his friends whenever the school teachers slap him around and he can't really do anything about it. Or being a little bit worried about like we have a big showdown coming up with this rival gang. I, I thought all those elements are pretty, pretty impressive. And I don't know where it classifies them as a gang because they do hold their own when they interact with other gangs. But it doesn't come off as like these are superhumans or these are super mm -hmm. tough guys. They're, they're, they feel like kids that are border, you know, sometimes scared, sometimes putting on a tough act to impress their friends, but not necessarily the heroes or that heroic archetype that, that you know, we're accustomed to. In our Domu episode, whenever we just got into things, you mentioned that you were trying to almost project your mind backwards in a way, trying to kind of like reimagine what it was like to read Domu for the first time. So let's put our mind in that headspace and imagine the first time that somebody might have read the serial serialized akira and the fact that you don't even get to see what this akira thing is for maybe years right yeah that's the biggest question i am not fluent in akira i've read it i've watched it you know i'm aware of it but, but doing all these rereadings has been amazing for me and whenever i reread for this show i made myself stop at volume one mm -hmm. yeah. you know like right, I, yeah. I wanted to sort of like really be able to talk about this book the way you might if this was the only one you read and one takeaway was it, it's pretty satisfying on its own there are questions at the end and the biggest one is akira for sure uh but as a whole it kind of works like if that were it I think I'd be very satisfied and very happy with it. I don't know about like, you know, weekly or bi-weekly installments, but as a book one, it's pretty satisfying. And I was impressed by that. But yeah, the biggest mystery is is definitely in my questions was Akira. And when you see like, okay, this is the room where Akira is. It's this like giant tank with all these tubes and, and handles and stuff. And so it's like possibly Akira is like a giant monster. 
you know, maybe, maybe he's like some, you know, you know, some kind of like, you know, Godzilla type thing. And almost like what, I don't, I don't know what, what Atomo's intention was. Like, did he always know what Akira was? Did he have um, like a vague idea? Did he have a couple options in mind? But it does seem like a really good sort of misdirection of like, here's this huge thing. You're expecting this huge something or other. And then like, you know, a tiny little boy walks in. But wait, that doesn't happen in volume. Not in volume. So, so, not, so we'll right. get to that. Right. But I'm just saying like, this, like knowing what I know, I know what Akira is, but getting in that headspace of not knowing, I see this giant tank and I'm like, what the fuck's Akira? Totally 100% agree, Tom. Uh, you know, like the one terrorist, Ryu, at one point, whenever they identified Takashi, and and he's like, well, "Who's Akira?" Then? Yeah, yeah. So he thinks and that Takashi might just be Akira. Further yeah. builds that mystery, that question. You know, it's not poor storytelling. It's very intentional mm -hmm. as to like, what is this? It's maybe a project, a code name. Who knows? Maybe we have anything. We have several translations of of Akira, and it might be worth taking a look at each one. Take a look at that sequence where the colonel goes down into the, like the Akira chamber, because in the Dark Horse version that I read. He plays the pronoun game, and he calls it they, it, never he, her, mm -hmm. like, none of that stuff. So he's even, at least in the Dark Horse version, there's that air of mystery that he is, I guess, intentionally keeping in there, if that's how it reads in, across the board amongst all the translations. And it is worth noting the difference, that there are some significant differences in translations. I didn't look that one up, but I was looking at, as I said, the epic edition, the Dark Horse edition, and the, the new edition, and I found some really different, major different yeah. lines. Um, whenever the clowns are attacking Tetsuo after he escapes, and he basically becomes their leader and, and kills the, their leader, that guy makes some, the dialogue's completely different, what, what the clown says, surprisingly. It's, it's very, it's almost weird, some of the dialogue, and I like that. Uh, but I imagine that that's probably true throughout the book. So probably definitely worth the comparison. Yeah, especially on a pivotal scene, like whenever we see Akira tank. Whenever the, the colonel descends into the Akira tank, there's that elevator thing. Mm -hmm. One question I have is, is that elevator thing a real thing? And the reason I ask that is because that has been mimicked and mirrored in so many video games, man. <laughs> Metal Gear Solid is like the big one. Like, like that will be a whole level... In in a like a Ninja Turtles game, so I wonder is 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 that because of Akira influence or does this kind of machinery like I've never seen something like this right, in the real diagonal life. elevator? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I I always just assumed it was a ref like the Incredible Hulk had a big sequence with, and I thought, oh, he's just copying Akira, you know, but. There were parking structures when I was in Tokyo that were, you would put your car on them and they were almost like vertical elevator kind of based parking, you know, small footprint, but kind of this tall lift. So they're probably similar. Like there may be an industrial application. Those, that whole building is massive. And to think of like the excavation to get down to it, you hear about it in conspiracy theories, these underground bases, but man, I don't know. It, it's a massive amount of machinery. I, I don't know what you would build uh, to that scale. I don't know of anything public really. Maybe aircraft carriers would have some kind of lifts of that sort. That that's another thing with with Otomo. Not, like not only is he a, an amazing storyteller, amazing artist, really good writer, but some of these cop cars and some of like uh, you know, there's that Masaru character sits on that like little <laughs> throne thing. Mm -hmm. He's like an amazing like vehicle designer totally, yeah. of like all stripes. You know, Ca like helicopters, that little Masaru throne thing. Greatest motorcycle ever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's it's true. I mean, I guess it comes from his interest in sci-fi, and it's just that evolution to this point where, like, now it's city and urban and many environments all in one massive story. You know, you almost develop those skills as a cartoonist. I'm sure you guys have both had this, Tom, probably with Transformers. You, you sort of learn to draw these things that it'd be impossible for me to draw a good robot, but if I did it for a thousand times, sure. I'd figure it out, and then it's part of your tools. Like, you can almost harness that. Yeah, I think, I I think that's, that's what he's probably done. I think this engineering kind of stuff is probably where his interests are closest. Like he's sort of figured out a way to like get good at all the other stuff, the storytelling stuff. But but if left to his own devices, like like the, all that all that design, um, because like reading Akira, reading Domu, it's like we've read other stories where we you know enjoyed the characters more or we you know felt more of a connection to it. But like my enjoyment of Akira is largely from just this like awe of like, whoa, like look, look at that beautiful thing. And, and, and not as much from the characters in the interact. Th those things are good, but like that stuff is like off the charts good. He nails scale in a way that you rarely see in comics. And he often cites Mobius, you know, as a, as a as contem contemporary influence. 
it's really hard to do. There, there aren't that many examples that you can point to in a comic and really say, and especially cities I find really hard. Because if you're able to read those characters, chances are you're seeing almost nothing of the building. You know, these things are huge, mm -hmm. but comics shorthand all of that. And that's a thing that he gets in Akira that's rarely seen is just the scale. Yeah, it's a non-human scale. It's like a beyond human scale. And it just naturally sends you places with the narrative and, and thematically sends you places just, just when you, you're re representing this sort of like post-human scale. Well, I think the uh, the scale of all these structures and, and Neo-Tokyo in general, it's a storytelling mechanism. Not necessarily for this volume specifically, but... When we have a post post apocalypse, right. <laughs> uh, it becomes evident that you want to establish this giant. You want to establish a city where there are many millions of people who inhabit this this area. Jumping ahead of ourselves with that though, question I have: We have K, we have Ryu, we have we have that team of uh, terrorists. Do we even have an inkling into what they're trying to do? Like earlier in the in the book. Whenever, you know, after Tetsuo crashes because of Takashi and, and all of that stuff happens, we find that uh, it was Ryu and, and the terrorist crew. They're the people responsible for getting Takashi out of there. It's not explained why. And he gets him out of there and he's running through the city, racing away from, from army guys and like covert ops dudes. And when the colonel shows up and they call him Takashi, and like you said, he looks at him and says, you're not Akira, and then looks at Masaru, who, if this was a live-action movie that took place in, in the 80s, tell me Hervé Valachez wouldn't have been, like, the greatest, <laughs> like, Masaru ever. Anyhow, Ryu looks at Masaru and is like, are you Akira? And it's like, no. So clearly, they want Akira, but why? Like, was any of that answered for you in this volume? Do you have any speculation as to what these terrorists are up to and they're called terrorists by the government who it makes sense that they would call them terrorists but are they a resistance force are they fighting for the people like i mean i think a lot of these things are left intentionally vague from a good storytelling point of view of like we're creating a mystery we want to you know figure out what it is uh that's going on as a reader but then also like kind of like as a creator sometimes you have like sort of a, a somewhat hazy idea of what your story even is as you're creating it and creating it serially and so sometimes I, I got the impression that maybe there's a little bit of like vamping going on of like putting out some like titillating little bits and pieces and then let's have an extended chase scene while I kind of figure out what the next story bit is or how these things go together. I thought that as well. You know, you were thinking of where where do the serial chunks end and, and start stop. I was thinking like what is what is laid out. He may have some idea of where the story is going to go. But all these details are, I, I assume, being a lot, being developed as, as he's actually drawing and writing, you know, these installments. And I think you're right about that, Tom. I think there are pieces that he's putting in place that who knows exactly how they're manifest. Another one of my questions at the end of the volume is, what do the terrorists want to do here? You know, it seems like they're connected to somebody inside. There's somebody that feeds them some information about, hey, the budget's suddenly blowing up on the Akira project, so we know they have an inside person. And, and that's revealed in, in Volume mm -hmm. 1. Yeah, in Volume yeah. 1, Little right? Nezu. Yeah, meet up, uh, a rendezvous. Uh, you know, so that's a piece that we get to this bigger puzzle. And I think even those two say they're not really sure what Akira is. You know, the idea that it's a person that they're trying to liberate, maybe they have some information on that. Maybe it's just something that they're guessing and, and don't really know. I mean, probably they are aware, if they have somebody on the inside, they may be aware of these psychic children and just making the jump that, that Akira is the name of one of them or maybe they only know there's one or think there's one. Who knows? So it's probably connected in that way where I'm not sure the terrorists know exactly. They may be anti-military. You know, I, I feel like a lot of people would be that after your city's destroyed. You're probably going to be very dubious, you know, as it's rebuilding. And it's like, why are we still funding this military whenever we're just recovering from World War III? You know, it could be people like that. The movement's more generally opposed to this group having so much power and so much secretive power. And they know something's going on with Akira, but don't really know too much. If so, if you're trying to expose like a government conspiracy, it's not like you have some clear idea of, of what it is from start to finish anyway. You have a sense that, that there's something they're not telling us, you know, just in real life, you know, that, that what is this? And there's a couple of little things that, that, that leak out. And so you're trying to figure out what something is without knowing what it is. So that, that makes total sense from like an in-story point of view. Okay. You're, you're basically, you know, the terrorists are essentially soldiers. Like they're all fighting for a cause together and, 
the soldier's not necessarily going to know what the biggest plan is. They just know what their job is. But it's totally parallel to Fireball. You know, we see right. it whenever they're like, we're trying to expose this, you know, this government official that we think is doing stuff wrong. And then at some point they get another piece where it's like, it's the computers running everything. But, you know, they don't know that the whole time. Like that's discovered in the middle of Fireball because a spy, con you know, on the inside lets them know that. But it's the same deal. They know they're opposing some of these policies. They may not know all the details as to how those policies are being affected or who the figurehead is that they're actually opposed to. But they're getting pieces where they can. And I think it's the same deal here. Otomo plays it perfectly because they don't have all the pieces and they set forth an amazing chain of events almost by accident whenever the terrorists uh, set an explosion off at the Olympic site. They don't know what's below that Olympic site. They don't know what's there. They just do it to kind of, uh, once again, a little bit unclear, but certainly to get into the in the in the mind, do some psychological yeah. warfare, if agitate. nothing else. Yeah, exactly. Agitate the uh, the the government. The focus becomes on the Olympic crash site. We find out that in the middle of that, because because it's a it's a it's a giant crater that covers miles and miles of ground, and somewhere like in the middle, far from the eye's reach. And by the way, the perimeter of this bomb site pre World War Three is quarantined off. You're not allowed to go there, even right. though the bike gang does go there. So further than the eye can see, there is a military installation there. And whenever uh, the bomb goes off, causes some panic, and like the military guys have to descend upon that to just like see see what the deal is, see what people might, may know. But the colonel is very kind of flippant about the fact that there is somebody running around on that base. He's just like, yeah, okay, you find the rat, kill the rat. Right. Which is Canada at the time, trying to get his bike. Right. You know, I think because of the site is a secret site, from time to time, I'm sure people come through. Kids, gangs. Yeah, like they do at the very beginning of the story. You know, just joy riders. Yeah, graffiti artists, who knows what. You know, p people whacked out of their minds on drugs, just wandering around, urban explorers. So I think that that's probably all. You know, I, I didn't read too much into it. That would be my guess is there's somebody here. D deal with it. We're an elite, you know, top of the line military program. Get rid of them. The colonel still has very high regard for the, the military guys like under his wing. That may change as the volumes uh, uh, continue. Do you find the colonel doing anything that makes him an enemy or a bad guy? I mean, obviously, they're kind of at cross purposes, but does he do anything that looks evil or bad? No, I mean, to me, it is like it's just an iconography thing. It's just like he looks like he might be the bad guy. He's old. He's almost bald. He's got, a, you know, a mustache, you know, but I, I don't think, yeah, he's just doing his job. And as the story develops, I, I mean, like future volumes and stuff, you kind of, yeah, he is like mainly like a, he's a professional, you know, doing his job. And and like in, in, in the movie, it's amped up even more so because he's like silhouetted and they're right. like light and, and it really looks like he's he's the heavy of the he's, Yeah, I mean, he's very imposing the way yeah. he's presented in the book and he's positioned antagonistically, especially right. with once Tasuo becomes like the object of desire. But I don't know that he crosses any lines anywhere. Yeah, if Otomo rejects heroes, he rejects villains too. There, there is no pure... Evil. Like, if you're trying to yeah. tell a rich story, there's no pure good, there's no pure evil, and you have to, as a creator, you have to put yourself in a position where you empathize and believe in all of your character's goals. You, or, or you just have snidely whiplash, mm -hmm. you know, tying people up to train tracks for no reason. And we're conditioned to look for a hero and a villain. So you can use that to your advantage of telling a story where none of these people are particularly bad or particularly good, but you know the the and and the the viewer or reader is going to learn that in the in the course of it but they're going to come into it with those preconceptions which i think otomo just does play very well on the no good no bad front we'll jump to that uh he does manage to have some surprising violence you know that seems to be a theme that's in all of these stories that we've seen so far and my example for this one is early on Kai shoots uh, one of the military guys in the head and it's like a whole page sequence. We see him get shot. We see him fall back. We see the stain of the, the blood, you know, from the back of his head. Like she kills this guy very clearly in the middle of the page. And, you know, I've read this a couple of times rereading it. That really stood out to me like, wow, that happens pretty early on. She is a protagonist or at least positioned as a mm -hmm. protagonist. I was kind of surprised by that. That, that seems like something... I don't know that you would see that in an American movie today. If 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 it, if it was a hero, I don't know that you would see that. In a lot of the fiction that we consume, the, the genre fiction, there does seem to be 
uh, 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 and the further back you go, there does seem to be a lot of scenes of like, just like, you know, like unloading your gun on whoever gets in your way. And like, if you think of something like, like, you know, Star Wars, where it's like, okay, how moral is it that you're just like mowing down these stormtroopers? Like, you don't know what their story is. They're just, they, they might just be, you know, that's, that's their job. They, they got drafted or whatever. And, um, you know, the Matrix, where like they gun down people who are in the story we know are, you know, indoctrinated and, and, and are doing this like involuntary or, or when like a Smith takes over them or whatever. So that's, that's just been like a, a, just a big part of fiction. And I think it's only relatively recently that, that we're starting to sort of question that and examine that, but it still happens all the time in action, you know, genre. There's a lot time. I think you can take from it. You know, you can look at this character that you're just starting to meet and see her dedication to the cause. Because we don't even know exactly what Akira is. It seems like they don't know exactly what it is, but she's willing to kill to try to liberate this thing that's maybe unclear what it even is. Yeah. You're, I mean, you're sold on both sides. There's your soldiers in a war, and again, we're conditioned to believe that if you're a soldier, in a, like that, you sort of have like virtue on your side. Or, but it, just the reality of it is, is not that at all. It's just part of the job. I like that part. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, it comes back to when we talked about Domu, and at the end, it's like. Is 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 Itsuko good? Is she bad? I mean, she, some people die that we clearly look at as innocents at the mm -hmm. very least, and she plays a role in it. And I think it's the same deal here where I like characters that aren't 100% good or bad. And that's what we see with her in this moment, in my opinion. And I like that. It makes for a much richer motivation all around because you do have several sets of characters that are sort of acting on their own motivation. And at times those motivations come into conflict with one another but it's not clear that like this is the right one cheer for this or you know this is the bad guy cheer for their defeat it's very much like well I kind of like this character because they did this other thing but now they're at odds with each other i, I think it's very rich yeah it's you know, like, an ecosystem yeah it feels like it feels like uh fiction as opposed to just genre fiction mm -hmm. let's keep uh, up with the theme of good and evil and this being cartoonist kayfabe we would be remiss if we didn't talk about the Tetsuo Hill turn. <laughs> <laughs> was it abrupt? Was it uh, elegant enough for your flavor, man? How, how did that work to you? Is he a heel? He blows up his friend's head. Yeah, this is a great segue, Ed, because you can see him as a... Uh, he's, he's a victim of the circumstances he's in. He did nothing to be psychically activated or to have that power or potential. And once it comes up, it totally changes him. You know, it takes over his character in a lot of ways, changes who his character is, becomes the dominant piece of who he is as a character. And it's tragic in a way, you know, like whether he was a pain in the ass or not, you know, like there's little sniping back and forth whenever they're all friends, but whether he's likable or not, there's nothing that's like, Oh, this guy's terrible. And then suddenly he's consumed in this and he's basically out, you know, it's almost a new character that emerges in his place you know, is he a heel? I mean, like, he's definitely an antagonist. He's a problem that's in front of everybody that needs to be managed in some way. So, you know, it becomes the driving force for everybody's actions after he after he appears. I mean, to me, it's clearly a heel turn in, in the truest sense. And heel turns are so much fun. And this is really <laughs> fun. It's like his his best friend, and then he disappears for a while, and it's like, oh, they have a new leader. The, the clown gang has a new leader, and he's real tough. And I, th I think it's Tetsuo. And, and then you see him, and he's like like this. It's It's like just... Like you're having so like those sequences in the book are so much fun, and he's just eating drugs. <laughs> yeah. Like the whole clown gang now is in the in in the business of getting him drugs that he's just consuming. It's the perfect again young adult rebel gang villain. Man, he he hams it up. He's a good one. When he when he starts out, when you first see Tetsuo in his earliest stages, see I'm infected by some of the things you said on the Domu episode, West Side Story, all that. And Tetsuo is almost like that little girl who wants to like hang out. With the gang guys, <laughs> yeah. man, because the, because he's like younger than them, and they're all kind of like making fun of him, like little bits here and there. Once again, that's amped up in the flick a little bit, right. but that's that's who he is. If if we're talking sharks and jets and shit, <laughs> he's just that little girl, like, oh, come on, let let me hang out with you guys. He also looks great. It reminds me yeah. of Unbreakable whenever they talk about the villain having the bigger head. Mm -hmm. You know, like like his head seems to expand whenever these powers yeah, once it, they show up, and the head makes him sort of vil look villainous look like a mutant but it all it also makes him look younger you know it's like a baby proportion or whatever and i feel like like when you talk about like like rooting for or identification or whatever if tetsuo were a little bit handsome 
Kaneda wouldn't even be in the running for like hero of of the book. You'd be like Kaneda all the like I love Kaneda. like it's it's just that he's goofy looking is the one thing that keeps people from like dressing up as him for Halloween. You know, <laughs> yeah, like the jacket. You're not wearing the 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 uh, Tetsuo jacket. You know, but Kanye West does in that one music video. <laughs> I say that because we'll put that that scene like right in the film. One of the things that I noticed with the gang, Kaneda's gang, is just how Otomo is becoming more confident as a cartoonist. When we were talking about in Fireball, his main character has that bandage on his face as like an easy kind of uh, accessory so that we can identify him all the time. When you have Kaneda's gang and they're all standing around together, now not all the characters are mentioned by name or anything, but you could easily tell them all apart. Mm -hmm. And I'll advise any cartoonist out there, draw the gang and I bet you a lot of the faces look the same. And it's not an easy trick to pull off, but Otomo does it here. He's firing on all cylinders as a cartoonist and storyteller at this point. Kaneda all of a sudden sees this uh, ghost of himself. Like, it's it's this, you know, floating, glowing, fiery version of himself say, saying something about, like, oh, you know, it happened. or you know, something. He says Akira. Akira, okay, yeah. So, you know... In the Dark Horse version. Right, mm -hmm. yeah. It's So it's a huge foreshadowing of who knows what. You know, but it's really compelling. It's 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 like this sort of thing when you know, like you get you get a, a message in a bottle, you know, from the future. Or it's it's kind it's kind of out of nowhere too. Yeah. Like, like there's nothing else in in the entire story that's like this. Um, I guess the closest there, thing would be the the when the characters phase out. That would be the closest thing, and uh, that always makes me think of like Lost. There were like weird time loops in the TV show Lost. And there was a moment at one point where characters were observing these characters from another time, and then they just they disappear. And they don't show that. And I remember like watching that and being like, that is brilliant. Because if you saw somebody just disappear, I can't imagine something being more hard to process. Mm -hmm. And and we see that, you know, like that's what Canada sees right in the beginning with Takashi. And then again, when he when he sees himself, when he has this vision, it's kind of a similar moment, you know, or or at least that's the way I would read it as being like, that would be the most unsettling thing and how to process something like that, you know, especially considering the other events now that he has seen and taken part in, like, it's like his world has suddenly become a different world. Right. It's like, like a border guardian, like in, in, in the, uh, the hero's journey or whatever, like you've crossed over into this other world. But again, like, it's a great tease. Mm -hmm. And when you're doing like, like at, if, if this can be used as, as a, as a class or anything, but if you're making a first volume of something, you want to th spread a bunch of seeds, throw a bunch of seeds out there. And there's a lot of compelling little seeds that, that some may grow up into a tree, some may grow into nothing, but but man, that, that was a really good one. We'll close on some of those. Uh, one of the teasers that is throughout this volume one is the relationship between Ry Ryu and, and Kei. I don't know what kind of fruit that bears. I'm teasing. <laughs> um, but we don't know where it's going, but it's implied that they have some relationship beyond brother and sister several times throughout the book. So that's not uh, explored at the end of, that's not tied up right. in volume one. Of course, the other big dangling thread is who, what, where, when, and why is Akira? Yes. Yeah, and that, that influences most of the questions that I have, you know, including the vision he has in the future, mm -hmm. you know, like we have no answer for that uh, to speak of. So, you know, one piece that we mentioned the military base, the Akira being like entombed or encased or whatever it is housed underneath the site of that explosion is a hint as to the origins of that explosion. You know, because I remember reading it and thinking, like, why would you ever put a base in this spot? But of course that's why, because that's where this event, like, that's where mm -hmm. Akira came to rest or ended or whatever. You know, it wasn't really up to you where you put the base. The base is a result of this thing that has happened that we see the effects of above it. And you could tease the public with uh, nuclear half-life and, and all and radiation, right, like, yeah. all that. So, like, so they'll want to stay far away yeah, that's like the Area 51 cover story. <laughs> <laughs> it's got the great tease at the end of like, Tetsuo, you want to come with us or not? We'll, we'll answer all your questions. Come with us. You know? He takes the pill. He needs so many pharmaceuticals to just kind of keep an equilibrium. When he takes that one big one, it's almost like he has now reached a point of no return. Colonel's like, Tetsuo, come with us. Calls him by his new number, mm -hmm. 41. Volume ends with that, man. That's another piece of that building of the pot, of the mm -hmm. questions. Like we've seen a couple of those numbers. Forty one's a lot. There's yeah, a lot there's of potential lot of in uh, stories there. there. I think that pretty much wraps up volume one. Yeah, I think so. I have no more notes on on the subject, man. So 
You guys know how the game is played in about four weeks. We'll have another episode live. We'll be talking about uh, Volume 2 of Akira as we continue celebrating 2019 and the works of the great Katsuhiro Otomo. So without further ado, my name's Ed Piscor. My name's Jim Rugg. My name's Tom Scholey. Like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Tell your friends. We're on an awareness campaign, man. We're on a race to 100K. And uh, we have Spread Shop Merchandise Store in the description below, you can grab some cool cartoonist kayfabe merchandise as well as all of our contact information is there. I don't know about you guys, I have a bunch of comic deadlines ahead of me, man, so I'm going to have to get back to it. Sounds good. You guys know what your marching orders are. Read more comics.